Are you seeking fulfillment for your life? Do you want freedom from fear? That's why we're here. Welcome to Jesus 101, introducing you to the real Jesus. And now, here's your host, Elizabeth Talbot. Welcome back to Jesus 101. We are so glad that you have joined us again because we continue in our study of the Gospel of Luke. As you remember, let's go over a little bit, uh, a review, what you say. As you remember, we have already discussed the fact that Luke wants everyone to know that they are included in the salvation that Jesus offers. Remember that he does his narrative, a man and a woman, a man and a woman, a man and a woman. He also does a Jew and an outcast, a Jew and an outcast, so everyone knows that they're included. He traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way to Adam. And that's why he always talks about salvation. He's the only one of all the gospel writers that calls Jesus the savior. Now, if there is something you need to remember about this is that because they're included, everyone receives great joy, this mega joy that we've been discussing all throughout our time together. And there are three words I want to give you. Jesus says he has come for those that are just down, you know, the destitute, the marginalized. So remember this, the least, the last and the lost. The gospel of Luke is the gospel for the least, the last, and the lost. Everyone out there, the prodigal son, the thief on the cross, even, even the good Samaritan. You know, at that time, the, the Israelites didn't like Samaritans very much, the Jews actually, from the southern kingdom. So when we have a parable in Luke 10 that the Samaritan, the good Samaritan is the hero of the story, we don't quite understand in this culture what that meant for them because always in the gospel of Luke, the outcast, the least, the last, the lost is the hero either of the parable, of the story, or, or any dialogue between Jesus and them. They, they, Jesus is always going for the outcast and the poor and the least and the last and the lost. Today we're going to start with Jesus' public ministry. Um, this particular sermon is the only one recorded in the Gospel of Luke. We are told that Jesus actually is teaching already in the synagogues, but we only get, of all the gospel, we only get one sermon with the content. We don't get any other time the content of what Jesus actually was preaching in the synagogues. And so this is very important and we're going to look at it in detail, perhaps because it is the only time that we're told what Jesus actually said. Now, the chapter 2, verse 14 starts like this. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through all the surrounding districts. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. So the first thing we are told is that Jesus is already teaching in the synagogues and he's being praised by everyone because everyone finds this so interesting what he's saying. Now, we're going to be told what he's saying in a moment. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth. Now, remember Nazareth? Well, Nazareth, we left in Luke chapter 2. Joseph and Mary were from Nazareth. They went back to Bethlehem because it was the city where David was born, and they were descendants of David. So they go to Bethlehem. There, they are going to have Jesus. And from there, they're going to go to Egypt for a while because Herod wants to kill Jesus, and we're told that those stories in the Gospel of Matthew. When they come back, they go back to live in Nazareth. And this is where Jesus grows up. So this is like he's coming to his hometown. This is his church, his synagogue. Everybody knows Jesus since he was a little boy in this synagogue. And so this is what it says, verse 16 of chapter 4. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as, as was his custom, so Jesus always went to the synagogue, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Now, this is very interesting because in the synagogues, you stood up to read and you sat down to teach. Okay, so here we have, and I'm going to stand up so we can get this whole thing. Instead of a book, of course, he had a scroll because books were not there at that time. We had the scrolls like the one we saw in previous programs. He uh, stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah 
was handed to him. So the, the, the whole scroll of Isaiah is given to him. And now because the, the scroll does not have chapters and verses like the books that we have, that we're holding as a Bible, Jesus looks for a place to read. Verse 17, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Now here the narrative slows down. Now this is, there's a lot of people in the synagogue. We see that there is an attendant and there's people listening, but the narrative is done in such a way that it slows down and focuses on Jesus until you only see Jesus. And, and you are given every verb that he does. He stands up, he grabs the scroll, he looks for a place and he's going to read now. So I'm going to again repeat verse 17. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. And this is what he read. After that, he's going to teach on that, but this is what he read. This is what he chose to read. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the good gospel, the good news, evangelion, to the poor. Remember Luke's emphasis on the poor? He has sent me to proclaim release to captives, freedom, a recovery of sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed. Luke has a lot of topics on freedom. Now, let, let me read Isaiah 61, okay, shall we? Let's go to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. This is where Jesus is actually reading from in this scroll. So if, if you have your Bibles, go to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. This is where he's reading from. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. What a beautiful quote from the gospel that Jesus says, look, this is related to me. And he says it, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Have you ever felt oppressed? Have you ever felt broken hearted? Have you ever felt that you're just captive in the situation that you're in? Have you ever felt that you really want freedom? You know, this, this country, the United States was, was founded on freedom. I remember when I became a citizen of the United States many years ago, the emotion that filled my heart when I went and they gave me a little flag and five thousands of us in a big auditorium you know, they told us, you're now citizens of the, of the United States, the land of the free. And we waved our little flags and thousands of people together. We are now part of this great nation of freedom. But many times personally, we feel still oppressed. Many times we are oppressed by the type of religion we may have or by the political system that we may have, or simply because things are not working out in our lives. And the first sermon recorded of Jesus and the only one in the gospel of Luke says, I'm gonna read something to you. I have come exactly for you, says Jesus. I have come to preach the gospel to those that have been oppressed because I'm setting them free. All of you that feel stuck, Jesus says, I'm coming for you. And if you feel like you're blind, I'm going to give you sight. And then he sat down to teach. You're watching Jesus 101. Welcome to Jesus 101. We are back studying the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. So if you're at home and have access to your Bible, Get the Bible, get your paper, get your pen so we can continue studying. Now, we left our study in the synagogue of Naz Nazareth. Do you remember Nazareth where he was brought up? These are people that really know him. Everybody knows Jesus. And they're talking and saying, hey, isn't this the son of Joseph? Now, Jesus just read the scriptures and we have a symbol of freedom here on the cross because Jesus just has read a very interesting passage from the gospel of, actually from Isaiah that is registered in the gospel of Luke. Isaiah chapter one, verse one and two is what Jesus was reading. Why don't we go back there so we can pick it up from there. Now Isaiah 
chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. It's a very interesting language, and let me tell you why. First, let's read it, and then I'll tell you why. Chapter 61 of Isaiah, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, this is very interesting because Jesus reads this back in chapter 4 of Luke, verse 18 and 19, and cuts the quote right there on verse 19, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, exactly like I did on, Luke, on Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. What was the favorable year of the Lord? Well, that is a good question. I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> the favorable year of the Lord was a year that, that God had given them. And we don't know much about how they practice this or when they practice this, but the favorable year of the Lord was the year of Jubilee. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the year of Jubilee. You're going to love this. When Isaiah is talking this language, this, this jubilee language for the exiles who are coming back, are being set free. Don't forget that Isaiah is, is, is writing in a time when it's a sad time for Israel because they are captives. And God is saying that he's going to set them free from the exile. He's actually using what we call jubilee language. But jubilee language precedes Isaiah. So... I know, I'm going to all over the Bible with you, but we really have to, to understand the whole concept of Jubilee. So come with me to Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25 is the chapter that actually talks about the year of Jubilee. Now, the number of freedom in the Bible, starting from the very beginning, is seven. Is, is, you have patterns of seven and God had given this number to Israel to remind them of their identity in him and of their freedom. So they have once every seven days. On the seventh day, they are to pause and remember that they are now sons of the creator and that they have been redeemed. So they constantly remember this. Now, once every seven years, the whole land will have a Sabbath, a rest of freedom. And so the land would rest, the animals would rest, everyone would rest. And, and it's really interesting because if you keep reading, you'll see that God says, I'm going to give you three years worth of harvest, one on the sixth year so that you have enough for the seventh, and then one on the seventh that you are not putting any seed in. And then I'm going to give you one more because on the eighth, you're just putting the seed in. And on the ninth year, you're actually going to get seeds, uh, harvest from the seeds. So he's going to provide for him all from there all these years so that they can rest on the Sabbath year. But every seven times seven, every 49 years, so not just every seventh day or every seventh year, but every seven times seven, they will have this incredible year of freedom. And that was called Jubilee. So let's read it. Verse eight of chapter 25 of Leviticus. You are to count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbath of years, namely 49 years. And something amazing would happen on that year. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. Don't miss that because the day of atonement was the one's one feast a year where they went to the most holy place and they sprinkled blood uh, on, the, on the ark and they were reminded how was it that a holy God could be with them through this blood that was sprinkled, of course, pointing to the cross. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall sound a horn all through the land and you shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim it a release through the land to all its inhabitants. Can you imagine if you were a slave and you had been a slave, I don't know, 25 years and the year of Jubilee was coming? Now, this is a ram's horn. I actually brought a real one, but there's much larger uh, horns. They're called shofars. A shofar was 
the, the sound that they heard throughout the land. Now, unfortunately, I can't blow it because it takes a lot of skills and a lot of lungs, which I don't have to blow this thing. But it, it makes a sound just like this. Really loud. One time I was preaching with this and there was somebody in the audience that had been to the synagogue, knew how to blow this. So she came up on the platform and blew it for me. The sound of freedom. It's the year of Jubilee. Can you imagine how you waited if you were oppressed or enslaved for that one? Ooh. Now, Jesus reads this in Nazareth. And he, he says, today, this scripture, Isaiah that was quoting Leviticus, Jubilee language, today, this scripture is being fulfilled. Now, a side note that you might find really, really interesting. Let's go back to Leviticus 25, verse 10. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release or liberty through the land to all its inhabitants. You know the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia? It has a quote on the bell. It's Leviticus 25, 10. It says Leviticus 25 in Roman numbers 10. And that's where he gets the name Liberty because the verse says, you shall thus concentrate, uh, consecrate the 50th year and proclaim it Liberty through the land to all its inhabitants. And this is in the Liberty Bell of the United States, Liberty through the land to all its inhabitants. Now, Jesus is saying, I have come because I am bringing you real freedom. I am the Jubilee. I am that day. I am the one that on the cross has sounded the shofar forever. If you were oppressed, if you were enslaved, this is the sermon that we have of Jesus in Luke chapter four, that he is the one that came to set us free and that he really is the embodiment of the year of Jubilee. Now, he is going to teach on this when we come back. You're watching Jesus 101. Welcome back to Jesus 101. We are studying Luke chapter 4. The one sermon that is recorded and of Jesus, the actual content of the sermon, the only one in the whole gospel. Now, you remember what this is? This is when Jesus said that the cross is really where the year of Jubilee started, where he set everyone free and all debts were paid. And if you remember, this was the sound that they would hear throughout the land on the year of Jubilee because everyone was set free. All debts were paid. All people that were enslaved were set free. The land that somebody had to sell because they just couldn't pay it anymore would go back to the original owner on the year of Jubilee. Now let's read it again so that we have the whole picture of the sermon that Jesus is actually preaching in Nazareth in Luke chapter four. So we're in Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25 is where the year of Jubilee is being explained. And I'm going to read again verse eight to 10 on Leviticus 25. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times, seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbath of years, namely 49 years. You shall then sound a ram's horn. Ooh. And I imagine there were many of these horns being sounded at that moment throughout the land because everybody heard it. And you shall then sound the ram's horn on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through the land. And you shall thus cons consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty through the land to all its inhabitants. Now, this country, when it started, the Liberty Bell has this verse. We studied this already. In chapter 25, verse 10, this proclaim a liberty through the land to all its inhabitants. And this is Leviticus 25, which is actually engraved on the Liberty Bell. Now, can you imagine when the father started this country and they said, we need to find a verse of freedom so that when this bell sounds, 
Everybody says, well, this is the land of freedom. We're being set free. We are coming to a land, the land of the free. We even sing about it. So this, this country really was started on the concept of freedom, which we get from the Jubilee. Now let's go back to the sermon of Jesus, shall we? If you have your Bible, we're back to Luke chapter 4. By now, you're probably very excited because this sermon of Jesus is turning out to be quite a sermon where he is drawing from a lot of concepts from the Old Testament that the people there would actually have known. Luke chapter 4. Now, a reminder, we are in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, and he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, says verse 17, and it was handed to him, he stood up to read. Now he read verse 18, 19, which are Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, which said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now this is language that Isaiah gets from Leviticus 25, from the year of Jubilee. Now he is telling that to Israel, who is a captive in the exile. Now Jesus reads this, verse 20, and he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant. See how the narrative slows down again? And he sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Now Jesus has sat down, not because he's done, but because in the synagogue, they read the scripture standing up and the person that was teaching would sit down to teach. So all the eyes are on him because he's about to teach. And this is the first teaching that he gives them. Verse 21, he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture of Isaiah talking of all the captives that are set free. This scripture that he's referring back to the year of Jubilee where the horn, uh, the shofar would be blown and everybody knew that they were free. This verse of Leviticus 25, 10 that our country was founded on the Liberty Bell and actually engraved on the Liberty Bell, Leviticus 25, 10. All of this freedom topic, this, this wonderful news today in your hearing, they're being fulfilled, says Jesus. And at this point, everybody is very happy with Jesus. So verse 22, and all were speaking well of him and wondering at his words of grace. You know, Jesus always preached words of grace to those that were the least, the last, and the lost. He was a little harsher with those that thought that they were doing it okay on their own, that they didn't need a savior but to the ones that were destitute, marginalized, least, last, and lost, always words of grace. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? Now I've heard a lot of sermons that say that, that they're going to get upset with him because he said today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. But actually the narrative doesn't show that. So far, when he says this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, everybody is happy with Jesus. Maybe this is good news to them. You know, maybe there are some oppressed there, some people in debt, some people that were waiting for the Messiah to come to liberate them. Of course, the Roman Empire was here at that time. Maybe they're saying, could it be that Joseph's son is really going to be the one that is going to set us free? And they're happy. They're very happy. Until Jesus starts talking about the scope of his ministry. You know, in Nazareth, Jesus is one of them. Jesus is one of them. So they are happy with that. And he's talking freedom and he's talking jubilee and he's talking release and liberty. So we all like that. And he's one of us. Is this not Joseph's son? But when Jesus starts talking about the scope of his ministry being greater than any particular group, they're not going to like it that much. I'm going to pick it up on verse um, 24. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own town. But so far he's been welcome. It looks like he is talking strange because he's been welcome. Verse 25, I say to you in truth, 
There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but to to Sarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Now remember, Tyre and Sidon is a bad place for Israel. That's where Jezebel um, came from. And she took everybody to the wrong worship of Baal. And so Tyre and Sidon is a bad place. It's an unclean territory. But God sent Elijah there. And he goes on, verse 27. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. We're going all the way to Syria. We're no longer in this map. At that moment, verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard him say these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built in order to throw him down the cliff. It's hard for some people to understand that this Liberty Bell that around here in the United States when it started and that actually is a symbol of the cross because the cross is our jubilee that is greater than any group and anything that we have ever imagined. And perhaps one of the things that is good news to you is that no matter where you are or where you've been, this includes you.